So it's my great pleasure to um, introduce to you Stephen Hick, who's been brought to us through St. Boniface Hospital, the Catholic Health Corporation, and uh, Canadian Mental Health Association, Winnipeg Branch. Um, thank you to everybody for agreeing to host this. My name is Don McDonald, and I am the new coordinator of the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program with the uh, St. Boniface Hospital and the Catholic Health Corporation, and, and I'm truly honored to be here. As a matter of fact, I have to pinch myself sometimes to say, wow, this job actually had, thank you. <laughs> um, so here's Stephen. The Compassion Project is just delighted to introduce to you Dr. Stephen Heck. So I'm, I'm going to read this, but it seems silly because uh, Stephen is um, not only uh, a gifted academic and a wonderful person, <laughs> he's also a very dear friend and a very special teacher to me. So He's on the faculty at the School of Social Work at Carleton University where he teaches a graduate course on mindfulness and social work. He has completed two level trainings at the Center for Mindfulness at the University of Massachusetts with John Cabot Zinn and Saki Santorelli, Florence Emilio Meyer, and Melissa Blacker. And he's completed numerous deliveries of mindfulness based stress reduction, MBSR training courses, MBSR retreats, and silent retreats. And actually, there's a number of people who are just coming off a silent retreat this morning that Stephen led for us. Half the people here, actually. <laughs> <laughs> all the quiet people, that's right. Or all the rowdies in the crowd. Hmm. He's also completed um, some insight dialogue training with uh, Gregory Tr Kramer and is ongoing training with uh, Matthew Flickstein of the Forest Way. He has two books in the area, including uh, Mindfulness and Social Work and Mindfulness and the Therapeutic Relationship. He is also, um, this is very special, he's also modified a version of MBSR, which he calls Radical Mindfulness Training, which I think is a really special program. So without uh, shaking anymore or, or uh, interrupting too much, I'm going to just turn this over to Stephen. Thank you, Don. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. It's great to see so many faces. <clears throat> Just kind of take in the crowd. So many young, uh, young people, and it's not that I have anything against older people, but uh, <clears throat> it's good to see you all. <laughs> so, it's about surfing. We've come to a talk about surfing, so we'll talk about foot position, <laughs> stance. <clears throat> no, um, it's about surfing. Is about surfing the the present moment events that come at us uh, as we go through about our life. <clears throat> Have you ever noticed perhaps that um, in each moment, in fact we could probably just take a pause for a moment here, although you may think about what's he going to say next, but if you just pause any, any moment in the day, You may notice that <clears throat> your mind is often in the past. Has anybody noticed that? Your mind's often thinking about uh, replaying a story, a conversation you had, um, an argument perhaps, or even a tender moment on the beach on holidays, thinking about a book you read. Um, so many just thinking in the past. So you're not really in the present moment. You're you're off. Uh, in, the, in the past, re reliving something that happened. Of course, that's gone, <clears throat> although that happened. It's your memory of what happened, which is not always that accurate anyway. So um, you're, you're kind of reliving an imaginary event that happened in the past. And the other thing you might have noticed is often your mind is off in the future. Thinking about the conversation you're going to have or thinking about the meeting you have to go to, or um, you know your your holidays, or decorating your uh, your dining room, or you know, renovating your kitchen, whatever whatever you might be involved in, you're you're, you're sort of 
that your mind's sort of spinning on that. You can be in beautiful nature, perhaps on a canoe trip. It's tranquil. You're canoeing and your mind's off somewhere else. Back, still back in the city, perhaps. So really, all I'm talking about is um, being present for our lives. Um, and our lives are happening in the present moment. That's all, all, all you have is, is the present moment. <clears throat> the rest is just um, thought based on memory or imagination. It's just thought. But what's happening here right now in this moment is life. And it's only by being aware at this moment that you can actually affect the future. Yeah, well, of course, the past is gone. So it's being present, paying attention to the present moment. Sounds so simple, doesn't it? Sounds very simple. It's, not, it's really not all that complex. Um, but it takes practice. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll be coughing a little bit. I have a bit of a cold. But it does take practice. You, um, you find that your mind wanders tremendously uh, when you're going about your day-to-day -day events, especially in a fast-paced society that we live in. You know, we're digitally connected. We're, um, thank you. <laughs> That was, that, was a, that was a prop that I planted just to make my point. <clears throat> so we, we, uh, we, are <coughs> we are this, we are so connected, so busy that we're rushing through life. We're not even noticing all the moments that we're having and that we're missing. We're not even noticing them a lot of the time. Um, you can go through the day and not even um, have, have noticed. What, what went on during that day because your mind was all over the place. Your kids can grow up and you kind of look at them when they're 18 and go, wow, what happened? What, you know, if you're not really present for, um, for the moments uh, with, with the children. So we're rushing through life um, with our minds elsewhere. So sometimes you have to... Uh, to connect with yourself. Everybody, lots of people probably have these little gadgets now, right? Carry them around with us all the time. In fact, I have a quote that came to me on the way here, and I got it off the, Googled it and found it. But sometimes the only way to connect to ourselves is we have to call ourselves. Yes, hello, Stephen. Yeah. Connect. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> and just, just to, because uh, we're so wired. Um, just to connect with ourselves every once in a while. So this is part of the uh, Compassion Project. So I'd like to talk a bit about um, how this relates to compassion. Might be a question that you have. How does mindfulness relate to compassion? And it's also um, in a healthcare setting, although I understand there's people from the healthcare field as well as um, people from other institutions as well as uh, the community at large. Is that right? It's a general. How many people are from the community not connected to a healthcare organization? Okay, quite a few. That's great to see. So I won't go on at length about the connections. Um, just to say there's lots of research out there. It's very new. It's uh, the last five years uh, that deals with um, paying attention to the present moment and the effects that that can have on healthcare organizations, so at an organizational level, any organization. And I can attest to this from personal experience in Ottawa where we've um, implemented it with community health centers. A model of health care that more primary and uh, preventative health care as opposed to uh, disease care, which I sometimes see that we're involved in in some of the uh, hospitals. And it also has a real impact at the um, level of self care, just looking after ourselves, paying attention in the present moment. How does that translate into 
caring for ourselves. Now, I, I brought a whole slew of slides here, but I'm going to rush through the, the, the research because I don't really think you want to sit here and listen to uh, uh, me go on about um, all the research. Obviously, I have a connection with social work, so I have a lot of um, data on the, uh, the effects of paying attention on um, social workers. Um, social workers experience a lot of stress, work-related stress and what's called compassion fatigue, uh, vicarious uh, trauma, secondary uh, trauma, and so on. More evidence, uh, healthcare professionals, um, evidence that finds that mindfulness is a mediator uh, between self-care and well-being. Um, hospital, 781 hospital professionals, role conflict was reduced with mindfulness training. So there's, a lot, there's ample research um, that's, that tells us that it has um, an effect on job satisfaction, lower levels of stress, and so on. I mean, as, as you could see, I, we could go on for a whole hour just uh, talking about all this research. And this is not, uh, this is not all of it. Um, an interesting PhD dissertation by Kane on self-compassion. It's very much connected to self-compassion. So, <clears throat> I'm just going to put all those up there. I don't like being tied to this uh, desk. So, I, you notice I didn't even start with the word mindfulness. Because it's kind of a term that's that's out there, and it's all it's very it's all very popular right now. And um, I could probably I could give you the whole talk without uh, even using the word mindfulness, as I was just starting just by talking about paying attention to the present moment. Because that's all that's all uh, mindfulness is. Now, as you may notice, because when you're in the shower in the morning, you're often not in the shower. When you're brushing your teeth, you're often not brushing your teeth you'll notice that the mind does wander. Does anybody else experience that, or is it just me? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the mind does wander. I mean, that's, that's what... We're actually wired to do that. The, the neuroscientists are actually finding that our brain is constructed in a way that it's, it's always in the past or the future for, for reasons. It's gauging past dangers, looking at uh, future dangers, and... Uh, uh, half the parts of the brain are uh, wired to uh, approach, and uh, the the other half is wired to uh, be adverse. You know, to to pull back from that danger, and the um, so we're wired that way. So it doesn't just that's why it doesn't come naturally. So there's nothing wrong with you if your mind wanders, but in a way we kind of have a prehistoric brain in a di in a digital age. We kind of haven't really. I think when you read the scientific literature, neuroscientific literature, we kind of haven't evolved to the extent that we need to to live in this era that we're, we find ourselves in. But you can, you, can, you can train your brain. That's the other thing the science tells us, is you can actually change, you can rewire your brain in many ways. But you can also train it to pay attention um, more so than um, somebody who's not doing some training with their uh, mind. Um, I had uh, just a personal anecdote. I had some uh, brain damage from uh, multiple concussions. So I, was, I got, uh, uh, you know, uh, some severe effects of, of brain damage in terms of not being able to, uh, to do certain cognitive functions. I had lost my balance and, and so forth. Um, and it was really mindfulness that, that what the doctors are telling me, I must have kind of rewired stuff, kind of sent the neurons firing around damaged areas and uh, got back um, cognitive abilities that uh, they really didn't think I would get back. So, uh, of course, I started reading books about, you know, change your brain and how, ways that you can. And, of course, mindfulness is... Uh, 
is one of those ways. I thought paying attention to the present moment is going to rewire my brain. Like, that seems awfully uh, strange. Um, but the more I practiced, I get the more I saw that uh, that it was uh, it was true. So perhaps I should consider giving you a taste of what um, mindfulness is. That's why I skipped through. I find with these talks, I could give you a lot of data, uh, a bit of a sales pitch, and you might remember bits and pieces of it, but mostly it gets replaced with new information uh, you know, the next day. So I thought perhaps I'd give you a sense of how easy mindfulness is, paying attention in the present moment, um, and maybe give you a taste of, of what that's like. And it, it's a, such a kind of taste that you could actually use um, yourself uh, in, throughout the day uh, without doing anything else. So you don't have to like uh, sit in the Himalayas for three years first, or you know, meditate and um, to, to actually start benefiting from um, paying attention. You can just start to pay attention and often uh, the, when we need to pay attention the most is often uh, when we don't, all in the shower, but you can not pay attention in the shower and you might, although you could slip, but uh, often it's not as damaging uh, as in other scenarios. And one of them is when you're in a stressful situation, whatever that may be, often it's social stressors. Right? We don't tend to get uh, um, chased down by tigers and eaten, uh, which was you know, perhaps the stressor <laughs> In the, uh, but the same things happen in the brain, regardless of whether it's a, uh, a polar bear that's chasing you down to eat you, which is maybe a little more realistic in, in uh, Canada. Um, almost had that experience, actually. Um, but there's not much difference in what happens in the brain, whether it's a polar bear chasing you down to eat you, or if it's a, it's a severe social stressor. Your, your HPA access kicks in, hippocampus, pituitary, adrenal glands all kick in. This whole, the whole system starts doing stuff. And it's not you doing it, right? You can't kind of go, oh, I need the HPA access. Please uh, go. It just, it just ha And you can't stop it either. Um, but you can be mindful in that moment when it's happening. Um, so you can, just, you can do something where you just uh, tune in. You just kind of drop in on yourself in that moment. You can do it any time, but during a stressor, that could be your kind of mindfulness bell. Ah, you can feel it. For me, it's butterflies in the stomach. Oh, stress, I feel stress is arising. So I can, I can, it's a mindfulness bell. I can tune into the present moment. So you can literally just kind of tune into, okay, what's my entire experience right now? What am I feeling in the body, mind, heart, what's, hap what's my experience within, and what's coming at me. So you just tune in to the entire experience in that moment. You can do that right now. Just kind of drop in on yourself for a moment. So I feel stress. Standing up here causes a uh, a bit of stress, so I can feel my heart beating a little faster, feel a little pressure in my head from, from the stress. Um, my body's warmer, feel warmth in my whole body. Um, so you just, that's just kind of tuning into the entire, entire experience. Um, and then you can, once you've done that, you just, you narrow the focus to your breath. You just bring your attention to the sensation of breathing at your nostrils. Just feel the breath. If, it's, if you find it difficult to tune into the, the breath uh, in your nostrils, as it, the air passes your nostrils, you can tune into the, the sensation of the advent um, expanding on the in-breath and contracting on the out-breath.
That's the narrowing of the focus. So we started with the entire experience and then we narrowed our attention. And you can do each of these for a minute. It's actually called a three minute breathing space. And then you can um, expand your awareness back out to your, your entire body and just see where things are at now. Just tune back in, expand it to your entire body from the nostrils or the stomach to your entire body. I can feel just the sense of dropping just from that little exercise in, in the room. Um, it's uh, so in a in a social interaction. If you <coughs> if you do uh, you you engage in a practice like that, it just kind of grounds you to that moment. That's all it's really doing. It's not a you know it's. It's got three steps and it's got a name and all that. But <clears throat> really, all you're doing is is bringing yourself to the present moment and kind of and using your breath as an anchor. The breath's a good anchor for for bringing because it's always there. It's not going to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything uh, special. You don't have to control it in any way. You just kind of oh, there's there's that body sensation. I can tune in. It's it's uh, life. Um, the organic being sharing uh, with with the rest of the uh, the world. So yeah, you can drop in on that breath anytime um, as a ground. So I'll I'll drop in on my myself, tune into my breath and my body, just kind of randomly through the day. Um, standing up here talking to you every once in a while, I kind of tune in just to to see where I'm at and. Um, where I, where I, you know, how I feel, and just to, to ground myself in this moment, not thinking about, oh, geez, when this is over, I'll be able to sit down and relax. And, um, just, you know, enjoying each moment of my life, because it's the only moments we have. It is our life. Each moment by moment, it is our life. Um, so, it, often we go through the day wanting to get to the next thing. You know, we're, we're at work. We can't wait to. Get home. We get at home. Got to make dinner. Can't wait till dinner's done. And we're eating dinner. Can't wait to eat dinner so I can go for walk the dog. I got to do those dishes. Got to rush through that so I can. I've been walking the dog. Oh, I can't wait till this so I can go talk to my neighbor or watch American Idol or whatever it is that you <laughs> you. Uh, so and I can't wait to go to bed. <laughs> then you're in bed. Jeez. It just goes on, and maybe that's not something you want to rush through. But <laughs> um, you just, and then it just starts all up in the morning again. So can you just be? Can we just uh, be present in that each moment of of our experience? <clears throat> um, there's a kind of a four-step uh, process that you can think about. Um, do one thing at a time. So multitasking. I know it's big with young folks because um, I teach and they like to Facebook, text, uh, write papers, and listen to lectures all at the same time. They do. And I actually had, I've had conversations with um, students and say, you know, I noticed you're on Facebook most of, oh yeah, you, you, this gender, we're multitaskers. We actually don't, we can't really concentrate unless we've got lots of sensory input. That's a dangerous, uh, so you should come to my mindfulness class. <laughs> that's a, a you know, that, that's a dangerous way to be. I don't, I, may, you know, I don't think it's an old person talking about, you know, a different, I think it's just a dangerous way to be that we're c kind of pulled in all these, uh, not doing any one thing. Not one, a moment isn't a moment, it's it's, it's all scattered. We're all we're, we're fragmented across all these different activities, so that we're not actually within any one of them. So my advice is: step one is do one thing at a time. And while you're doing it, step two. 
While you're doing it, if your mind wanders, just notice that it wandered and bring it back to what you're doing. Well, that's actually step three. Notice that, bring it back um, to what it's doing, what you're doing. That's step two. Step three is do this about three billion times because that's going to happen a lot. And step four is uh, notice what, what pulls your mind away. Notice what pulls your mind away. Notice what those distractions are. Um, there's a lot that can be learned from seeing deeply what, what, where our mind's going. Um, it's mindfulness, you know, that's why we, we're really looking. We're mindful of what, pull, what's pulling our mind away. So it's not just, it's paying attention, but it's also being aware of, oh, okay, what's, what, what's, what's pulling my mind in that direction? And looking at it um, with curiosity and interest to see what it is. To see what it is. You, you might find you're a little surprised when you really look at what's pulling our minds, minds away. One thing I found is I'm actually the center of the universe. You didn't all know that, did you? Right now I actually am in this year. Uh, but, but you all probably have the same thought, right? We all think we're the center of the universe. Again, we're wired to think that way. It's natural, so I'm not trying to, it's not uh, meant to uh, be insulting. Um, we all think that way. So we, we look, so what's arising? A lot of that has to do with me, myself, and I. It's a, it's a, a great grand Broadway production starring me, about me, written by me. And so we just kind of tune into that. Oh, that's interesting. So I'm going to do this, I'm doing this thing that is compassionate for another person. But actually what's arising in my mind is, oh, I hope, I hope she really likes me for doing this. Hmm, that's more about me than her. Not, and then I'm not trying to say, oh, bad person I am. It's just noticing, ah, this is me at the center of the universe again. That's okay, just noticing it without judging. I mean, the big, big part of this practice is not to, to judge ourselves, but to just notice and see deeply. We're all doing it. You know what? We all do it, but we don't tell each other. Right? It's like a, a secret that we're all self-centered, but we don't want to tell anybody else. Because if they find out we're so self-centered, they may not like us that much. So it's a, like it's a big secret that we all keep from one another. And what mindfulness does, especially when you do a retreat or something, and you get together in a group, and you uh, practice together, people start sharing, everybody kind of goes, oh wow, I'm not the only one that has that. This is amazing. It's an amazing insight to see how, how, how similar um, we are in that way as, 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 as human beings. It's amazing. And, and, and it's awakening. It's a wake-up call. It's not necessarily easy, though, because if we start judging, right, we can, we can get into the, ju the judging mind mode where we start to say, oh, wow, this is too much. I mean, I, I'm, uh, so I didn't think all this was going to happen. <laughs> that I was going to see. Deep seeing is there's a bit too much see, to see here. That's why it's helpful to, sh you know, to share with other people and see that, yeah, everybody's seeing similar things. Everybody's, um, everybody has these self-protections that arise. That you know, we want, we want security, we want to be loved. And so a, a lot of this kind of, I call it selfing, goes on so that we can um, have, a, you know, that protected environment and be loved. 
a lot of it stems from that. Um, so we can start to see how each of us do that. So where does compassion fit in? Where does compassion fit into this? <clears throat> Compassion's a, a natural a natural primordial human characteristic, human emotion, human doing, we act compassionate. Compassion is actually a verb to me. We, we do compassion. But often, this selfing that I call, this eyeing and meing in center of the universe, gets in the way and, and um, obscures it and distorts it. So when we can see that and let that kind of break away a bit, be more genuine and authentic, so this a kind of natural compassion comes in and fills fills that, that space that's left and flows out. So mindfulness and compassion are really two sides of the same coin. Um, I've got a quote from Einstein. Einstein called it a prison that we live in. Um, I was sleeping in the car. Sheila was driving me here from the retreat and I was tired from the, so I was sleeping and I woke up. I thought, Einstein has a quote about, she told me about the compassion um, project. I, I know he does, so I googled it, and lo and behold, he really does. Wasn't just dreaming it. Um, and here's a quote from uh, Albert Einstein. You all heard of this? He's kind of a smart guy. Did a few um, notable things in his life. I love this. This is almost a, a call to, com to the Compassionate Project. A human being is part of the whole, called by us, universe. Beautiful a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts, and feelings as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness, delusion that we're separate. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion. I have shivers reading this. To embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Then he, he concludes, nobody is able to achieve this completely, but the striving for such achievement is in itself a part of the liberation and a foundation for inner security. I mean, that's basically what I'm talking about, <laughs> is um, how we live in this kind of delu optical delusion of consciousness um, that has us as the center. It's our desires and our needs. And um, we need to see that and break out of that into a circle of compassion and embrace all, every, every, every um, the world and the earth, every uh, living, organism, every human being, and the planet. So it's a beautiful quote, and I think it really, um, I think uh, Einstein really displayed this kind of notion. I mean, he's, he knew physics, so he knew a bit about uh, the universe at, at the level of, of mathematics and physics, which I will never understand. But uh, he, he combined that with some insights from being a human being and living in the world which he did often, actually, in his work. So <clears throat> the, the notion of freeing ourselves from the delusion, which we can see by paying attention moment by moment. So that's the practice. Um, and by paying attention moment by moment, to seeing the thoughts that arise, we, get, we start to see this optical delusion of consciousness. We start to see how. Um, Thoughts are in the past and the future, how there's a lot of uh, meing and, and mying in that, um, <clears throat> which is natural and we all do it. Um, you share, you start to see it happens to everybody, so it's not, there's no use judging about it. It's it, the fact that you're starting to see it is wonderful. Because most 
people that don't have the opportunity, I mean, the fact that you're here is phenomenal. The fact that you're here, what, I mean, what drew you here? You know, maybe uh, you, you had to be here for your job, I don't know. Or what, but whatever, or you had space in your schedule, there's all these reasons that come to mind. But I bet you there's something more fundamental under that that, that drew you here. There's something more fundamental. We all know deep inside that, that, that contentment or um, ease, peacefulness in the world is elusive no matter what we do. So when you hear of something like mindfulness, you think, oh, maybe that's something that can point me in a direction to find this ease, this contentment, this peacefulness in the, in the world. So it's, uh, it's beautiful that you're, you're here and um, that you can get a taste of, of what the practice of mindfulness, of paying attention to the present moment is, is um, what it's about. We don't, um, we don't tend to find contentment in the things that we think might bring us contentment or ease in the world. Um, I often thought that uh, piling up a lot of degrees would help. People would see me, you know, in, in a particular way. Um, thought that piling up a lot of uh, possessions would probably make me happy. That's what the uh, advertisements told me. It's kind of what society <laughs> told me. I was actually being a you know good citizen. But the more stuff I bought, the bigger the pile of garbage I had, and I bought a lot of stuff. And not so much today, but back many years ago, it was almost a status symbol to have you know a big TV box and a big, you had all this stuff that you were buying. But that was, didn't, you know, filling all those desires didn't seem to, to do it either. So just mindfulness is, is uh, just another way to, uh, to see um, perhaps where um, contentment lies. Now, um, mindfulness is used uh, as practice for self-care um, it's also used uh, as an intervention for people with depression. I believe I have a chart here. I'm going to skip through a bunch of slides here. Breathe, you are alive. Well, this is interesting. <clears throat> so uh, a guy named Richie Davidson at the uh, University of Wisconsin did a study where he, he uh, attached a functional MRI to, to people's brains um, and put them through a meditation, eight-week meditation course to see if there's difference in their, uh, in, the, in the brain that, that happened. So that little is the left prefrontal cortex. Any neuroscientists here? Am I getting it right? I think it's the left prefrontal. I see a few people nodding that look like neuroscientists. So. <laughs> they look really smart. So. Um, and the left pre prefrontal cortex actually uh, get, uh, lights up, it's seen on a functional MRI. Um, so that's from an eight-week um, introduction to uh, mindfulness. So I don't know what happens if you go for 10 or 12 or <laughs> the whole thing might like be a big uh, Christmas tree bulb. <clears throat> These are just a few of the, you know, and I don't want to go into them all, but mindfulness is being used as an intervention in, in, in many healthcare settings in many ways for many um, uh, DSM diagnoses. Um, I've used it uh, with all kinds of different uh, groups of people. 
and I always sort of do the research and there's uh, positive outcomes every time I, I, uh, I use it with folks. And the research, much more rigorous research than what I'm doing bears that out. John Kabat-Zinn was the one who uh, started um, MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is likely what, if you were going to uh, introduce yourself to mindfulness, would be a, a very good way to um, ease yourself into the process of practicing mindfulness. Um, John invented, you know, started doing this in 1979. It's put, they've put tens of thousands of people through um, MBSR at UMass, and it's, it's uh, spread all over the world. It's probably the fastest growing um, phenomenon right now in healthcare and psychology and social work. This is a MBCT, just mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Just I'll go quickly. Is uh, um, Zindel Siegel out of uh, University of Toronto uh, adopted MBSR and came, with, brought out this um, program that just goes to show you the uh, effectiveness of it. Out further, you can see it's. 66% versus 34% um, as you go out to uh, 60 weeks. And the reason is cognitive therapy tends to work very well short term because you teach people how to replace negative thoughts with positive thoughts. But what happens is they, they, don't, um, they lose that skill over time. Their ability to do that decreases tremendously over time and they have depression or relapse. But with mindfulness practice, you, do too, you rewire the brain, but you also give them a lifelong skill that they can always come back to, paying attention in the present moment. So that's uh, just a few, of the, um, uh, a few of the ways that mindfulness is being used. And then the other, of course, is, um, and this is my, um, close to my heart, is the way that mindfulness is being used with healthcare providers to improve the uh, helping relationship or the therapeutic relationship. And this is key to all people in any helping, whether you're a physician, a nurse, a social worker, whatever it might be, um, because a lot of the outcome comes from the relationship you have with that person, especially in the, in the uh, helping professions that deal with the psyche. Um, in fact, uh, we found uh, in social work and psychology that a higher percentage has to do with uh, the relationship than the intervention that you use, which is kind of phenomenal because we teach 90% intervention at the universities. <coughs> so that's the other place that, uh, so the, the, uh, you, the ways that mindfulness can apply in a, in a place like this is uh, for self-care, and to improve your, um, your care of others. It opens up channels of compassion, opens up channels of presence, because you're present. You can be present. If you're, if you're in the present moment with the person, you're, you're listening to, to their words deeply. So you're not thinking what you're going to say next. You're not thinking about you know, the, the next patient, you're with the present moment. So paying attention in the present moment really does have an impact on that um, relationship as it's happening. I just thought I'd throw all that stuff in quickly at the end just because uh, some people might be interested in the other applications. I would like to leave time to open it up to questions. We still have 15 minutes, so we have lots of time for questions. I really like the question and answer part to kind of get at what interests you. I believe there's, is there a microphone that people should use? Yes? There's one right over here. Go for it. I've gathered that uh, mindfulness is also used for pain control. Uh, you haven't mentioned that, and I'm wondering how prominent is that approach? Uh, it's not an area of, uh, 
everybody hear the question regarding pain control? It's not an area of expertise, um, uh, but I have had people with chronic pain in, in different groups that I've led and have had some um, benefits from it. I know John, uh, John's um, group in, at UMass, uh, especially when they first started, it was a tremendous uh, number of people with chronic pain. Most of the doctors were actually referring people that they could no longer help with uh, traditional kind of interventions other than uh, painkiller, you know, narcotics. So they, they were doing a lot of um, work in that way. Um, it, what, 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 it, what it does is people in chronic pain, this is what I've noticed, um, so it's anecdotal, and I, well, I think the literature bears it out as well. We have the pain, so there's uh, suffer, physical suffering, there's pain that, uh, that happens, that's manifesting physically. But then on top of that is the story about the pain that arises in the mind. And the story about the pain actually causes more suffering than the original physical pain. It can actually exacerbate the physical pain. It affects our whole system. It affects us uh, psychologically, physically, uh, and so on. So that's, that's really what mindfulness is, is getting at. It's changing our relationship to the pain. And so people are quite astonished because you tell them, well, you know, I'm, just, I'm not going to get rid of your pain. Because you know, that, that's what people want. They want to be fixed, right? You get, they get the idea that, yeah, okay. They, 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 under, they start to realize that they can change their relationship to it. That in this moment, I can live with what's happening. And then, this, and then there's the next moment. I don't know what's going to happen you know, tomorrow or this evening or the next day, but I can go moment to moment. And there's more right with me than wrong with me in this moment. So they're really getting people to look at the pain. And, and sometimes it's, it's phenomenal what, what happens because um, it, it, it gives them a new outlook on, on, their, on, their, on their whole way of being in the world, not just in relation to their pain. Yeah, just uh, go to the mic if you have. A Thanks. This um, technique has, well, um, at least the term mindfulness has a relationship to Eastern religion, given, um, you know, Buddhism teach not Han writes a lot about it. And I'm wondering um, if this technique so taught to social workers and medical professionals, et cetera, and that fellow that you just cited on there, um, how do they, did they get the ideas from there and how different is this practice from um, its inception in the East? Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> you don't have to uh, become a Buddhist <laughs> to practice mindfulness. It's a, it's a universal human quality to be able to practice paying attention in the present moment. It, it has its roots, the word mindfulness itself has its roots in, uh, in uh, you know, a 2,500 year old uh, uh, tradition of uh, meditation. But uh, in no way do you have to um, practice or become, a, you know, submit yourself to any religious authority to practice mindfulness. It's, um, it's a practice that, that can be integrated into a healthcare setting without any, you know, uh, religious beliefs or um, um, trappings or uh, submission to any kind of, you know, authority such as the Buddha. Um, and I think that's that's um, that's fine. Oh, I mean, or if you want, you can you can. Uh, I mean, it does have a spiritual dimension to it. Uh, in, given that this is uh, connected to a spiritual tradition of Catholicism, I don't. I can see how it, you know, it can fit in with, <laughs> with the, the mandate of this institution. Doesn't mean that you know, 
you have to, you, you can't be Catholic or you can't be uh, Muslim or, in, it, in fact, it, it will get you in touch with those spiritual roots, perhaps. I've seen that happen too. People go, oh, I just kind of, I just saw something in, you know, in my spiritual tradition. It just connected me in that way because you connect with life because right? you're seeing your life moment to moment. And what are the spiritual traditions about, really? They're really about life. Connecting with one another and connecting with the flow of life. So there is that, there is that connect. But I've offered it, you know, without any spiritual connection whatsoever, just as a healthcare intervention. And I've also offered it in uh, you know, United Churches in Ottawa, that where it has a, with the minister sitting there, where it's had a spiritual connection. And I've offered it as a, as a Buddhist practice as well. So I mean, it, it, can, it can fit in anywhere. To me, it's a human, it's our human, it's part of our being human. It's not part of our being a this and ism or a that ism or a, uh, you know, something like that. Um, the one, the Buddha did <laughs> write down some fairly specific instructions about meditation though that can actually be quite helpful in, in, uh, in doing this practice. I don't think too many people spent, uh, you know, the time in terms of, docu you know, documenting and happened to have an attendant with a photograph, like a, a memory that could remember everything he did and said, so they were able to uh, to get this all down. So there is a there is some value in that in that information that's out there. Yeah, but don't worry, you don't. It's not like a, trying to make you a Buddhist or anything like that. Any other questions? You had your hand up? Uh, no? Yeah. I think there's people maybe linked in and stuff, yeah. I thought it was a race. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I understand how um, doing practicing mindfulness can develop more compassion because um, it silences that inner critic. So the less critical we become of ourselves, uh, the more compassion or the more understanding we can have of others. But how, as a scientist, can you explain how it is happening neurologically in our brain, how there's that connection? Not really, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not that kind of scientist, sorry. <clears throat> um, uh, what's the, is it Dan Siegel has the book, um, what's the title? You guys probably know. The one about, is it Mindful Therapist? I thought there was one about how the brain, the brain that heals itself. The brain that heals itself. Yeah. There's a few books that uh, I, I have read years ago. Um, that sort of talk about, you know, I actually don't get too excited about looking at pictures of the brain and descriptions of the amygdala and the hip, but it apparently does a lot of these kinds of things neurologically. And that's, I mean, that's where the research is at right now. Uh, we, in fact, apparently we've discovered more about the brain in the last 10 years than previous, you know, 500. It's just, um, and and a lot of it has a lot of research is being done on how mindfulness uh, affects the brain, and, it, and it's not a fringe um, uh, specialty either. It's a, it's seen as a core area to do research in right now. Is getting a lot of funding internationally um, in this area. People, it's the the uh, the neuroscientists are, are are just engaging with this at a tremendous rate looking at so many different ways that the brain um, changes from this, this uh, simple activity of um, paying attention in the present moment. So Stephen, I just want to invite any of the LinkedIn sites. Are there any questions from the LinkedIn sites? Okay, I think we have one last question. Yeah. I just uh, want to ask more explanation on the compassion aspect of, um, of mindfulness, uh, especially when it relates to 
like depression. And I ask, if I'm doing this, how will I have compassion with people who are depressed if I myself have not been depressed? Now, how does that connect? How do I, how, how does that only connect when I'm doing this with other people in terms of this depression, compassion? And second question is, this is about which kind of population? What is the target population for this mindfulness? Okay. Thank you um, for the question. Uh, the, the, the target population um, are, is human beings, basically. Any human, and I don't mean that to, um, to be sarcastic. It, it really is for any, anybody, um, any person can practice mindfulness and, and benefit from mindfulness. So it's, although it's being, you know, uh, repackaged as, in, as interventions to use with target populations with depression, personality disorder, chronic pain. I mean, there's a long, long list now if, in the research. It's, it, it's actually for everyone. Um, it benefits these certain populations used in a particular way by you know, tra trained um, people in those interventions. But it, it has huge benefits for just any, any person, in particular, people in the healthcare and helping um, professions. And the way it opens compassion is it, it's um, connecting us. We feel connected instead of separate. And it's that be connecting with others that draws out the compassion. So you can, um, compassion actually means calm is with, and passion, um, the root of passion is actually suffering. We think of it as something else. Uh, but it's actually to be with the suffering of another. That's what compassion is. So that's all you're, you're actually doing. You don't have, have to actually have experienced the suffering of that person. I mean, that perhaps if you had, that would give you some unique insights into what they're, but you're just being with the suffering of the other much like you would be with your hand if it was burnt, right? You wouldn't say to your hand, burn your hand, oh, hand, the hand is burnt. Should I do something about this hand or should I just leave it? You'd be with the, the suffering of that hand and so because you're just as connected. So it's a sense of being connected with, um, with the other people because you've kind of gotten the, the, the center of the universe <laughs> kind of mentality has, has perhaps faded a little with um, with the practice. And I know that's maybe hard to get your head around. All I'm talking about is paying attention to the present moment. But really the only way, you can't really get this um, by listening to me talk or by reading it in books. The way to do it is to just practice it. Practice paying attention in the present moment. We, the reason we sit and meditate is because it's a controlled environment. So it's a little easier to do that when you're just sitting or in a chair or standing somewhere. Um, it's a controlled, so there's less sensory input. But really, you, you, you can do it any time during the day. It's part, it's, it's, mindfulness is, is life practice. It's uh, not about the, being on the cushion. It's just practice for being out in the world. So I'm mindful that our time has come to an end. And on behalf of everyone here, Stephen, thank you so much for traveling. And being here.